Daniel is the most controversial book in the Bible. There's a lot of criticism about Daniel. Go figure, right? The word of God criticized? No. Anyways, Daniel is the most criticized book in the Bible. There is a ton of controversy in the book of Daniel. And I would not be a, um, I would not be a um, responsible pastor if we just kind of skated through and we never brought this up. But I've spent all week, indeed, Thursday afternoon, I had to leave the office because I was just so overwhelmed by all the information. So I've just been, I want you to know that I've been just studying this like crazy because I want to have it right. I want to know. And uh, you may want to go there as well. It's fascinating. It's overwhelming. It's all those things. But, but it's, um, there are some controversies and there are a lot of criticisms. And the main criticism, because what we're doing is we, we crossed the threshold last week into chapter 7, which left behind the Sunday school stories, the narrative, the histories. We left that behind. And now what we're moving into is these weird and wonderful prophecies. It's called apocalyptic literature. And it symbols and it's all these kinds of things. And it's kind of hard to digest. So you, you have to shift gears. But as we shift gears... The world also looks at this, or even some people in the church and go, no, that couldn't be. And so it rises all this controversy. Because the main issue with Daniel was he was so accurate. Hundreds of years in advance, he predicts history by the glory of God. Hundreds of years. Kings and kingdoms and all this stuff. And it's like, there is no way he could have done that but God, right? But God. And so... Uh, People nitpick Daniel, people point out dates and errors and problems and all that kind of stuff. And I just want you to know that before we head into this. And I, I you know, I have not been dissuaded, I need you to know. I've done a, a lot of research. I actually came up, I, I couldn't sleep on, uh, I think it was Friday, Friday to Saturday? Yeah, yeah, Friday to Saturday night, I couldn't sleep. And I, you know, Carolyn was like, what's going on? I'm like, I feel like Daniel. I'm on my bed and I can't sleep. And I had to get up and I had to list out because I had all these random thoughts in my head and I, I had to like bring them uh, to a list. So I came up with, if you're interested, we can share this over coffee or I can send it to you. I'm willing to have share my entire document with you. It's a bunch of chicken scratch right now. But I came up with 22 reasons why the book of Daniel is authentic, true, and real. 22. Uh, in my research, there are about six things that they point out, and again, we can talk to them, and we don't have time, because I'm trying to do the half an hour thing. <clears throat> it might be 40 minutes. <clears throat> <laughs> Anyways, you need, you need to know that, okay? So this is something where, uh, in terms of your relationship with Jesus, your maturity in Christ, this would be a, a more mature place for you to be. Because most people, they just want to camp. Can't we just read Philippians 4 and just rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Let's be happy people. Yeah, that's in the Bible. But this is also in the Bible. And so we have to, we have to go, like, what is this? Because there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. One of the proofs why I think Daniel is true and real is because Jesus endorses Daniel. Jesus quotes Daniel. So if Daniel is not true then Jesus quoted somebody who was a farce. So it is, it's of the highest significance that we know what we're doing as we approach Daniel. Again, if you want to hear all my reasons and all that stuff, we can talk about it. As we approach apocalyptic literature, we need some rules because it's intimidating. It's hard. It's hard to sift through this stuff. And so here are six rules that I'll give you. Number one is we have to embrace the symbolism. You're kind of like, well, it's bears, and it's, today it's going to be goats and, uh, goats and rams. And you're like, what is he talking? Is this a football game? What's going on here? Uh, you have to embrace it, okay? Number two is you have to prioritize the original audience. So Daniel was writing in the 6th century, back when they thought the world was flat. He's writing from the middle of a desert. He didn't even know North America, South America, Australia existed. There was no internet. There were no lights. There were no cars. Okay? And so you kind of have to put his mindset on as you're engaging this, at least a little bit. Because he's not writing to the North American church. He's not writing to the 21st century, and that's where we live. Okay? So you have to prioritize the audience and go, okay, what is, what's happening here by way of that? Number two is, and we'll learn about it today, don't overanalyze the symbols. 
And well, there's a great example coming up. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it in a second. Uh, also, patience is the key. Give yourself some time. Daniel gets to the end of this and he goes, I don't, I don't get it. So if you get to the end of this and you read it, you go, I don't get it. Maybe God, the Spirit of God is just saying, well, what did you get? Right? Maybe you're not responsible for the whole thing. You're just responsible for one thing. Carry that out. Okay? So be patient with yourself. Number five is we can always pray, God, illuminate this to me. Help me. Your spirit is supposed to lead and guide in truth. That's what Jesus said. If I go, I'm going to send a comforter. He's going to lead you and guide you in truth. So help us. Help us. Isn't that awesome? We can just say, God, I don't get it. That's what Daniel does, essentially, as well. Uh, and then number six is we just need to trust. Because there are stuff, i got to admit, I don't get it. I don't understand it all. I don't understand some of the numbers. I don't understand how they all line up. I don't know. There's things that a lot of people don't understand. They can speculate. But at the end of the day, we have to trust God. Is that fair? Okay, let's read. So we're in Daniel 8, and this is so great and specific. The further along you go in Daniel, after you get past, well, actually, get past the, the, uh, the first six chapters. Daniel 7 was what we talked about last week. It's a mirror to uh, Daniel 2, and we'll talk about that in a second. Daniel 8 gets more specific, and then Daniel 9 gets more specific, and then Daniel 11 will blow your brains up. He's just literally writing history 600 or 400 years ahead of time. It'll just, it'll just like, that's what people stumble over. they like, I, I can kind of get this, but 11, I do not, I do not know how this happened. He's literally writing it as if it was a newspaper. So, anyways, that's what we're up against. Anyways, let's just do eight. And last week, we got the blessing of, of Gabriel showing up and going, oh, you don't get it? Let me explain it to you. He does that again today. So, yay. So if you don't figure it out, there is the interpretation at the end. So thank you, Lord, for sending Gabriel to interpret for Daniel so that we know what the heck is going on here as well. Okay, okay. So Daniel's vision of a ram and a goat, we're going to start in verse 1. In the third year of Belshazzar, remember last week was the first year. And then verse chapter 5 is the 14th year, or the last year of Belshazzar. So we're kind of tucking this in before um, chapter 5. Okay, so it goes one, two, three, four, seven, eight, five, six, right? Anyways, I feel like I'm calling bingo. Uh, in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, first person, had a vision after the one I, that already appeared to me. He's talking about the one he had two years earlier in the first year of Belshazzar that happens in chapter seven. So he's kind of like, all this stuff is happening. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, okay? Susa, he was nowhere near Susa, but in his mind's eye, he saw himself in Susa, the capital of Persia, the winter capital of Persia. Per Persia was one of those places that had four capitals. He sees himself in the citadel of Susa, capital of Persia. Remember, he's, if you put your brain on, he is in Babylon in this moment. And they're doing very well, thank you very much. Babylon's A-OK. -okay. No trouble yet, but somehow he sees himself transported to, to Persia. Verse 3, oh, in, uh, yeah, in the province of Elam, in the, in the vision, I was beside the Uli Canal, which again, you can look up for yourself, it's all there, and the citadel sits above, it, sits above it. So how he knew this, we, again, people don't know. I looked up and there before me was a ram, so picture a ram with two horns. We know from the interpretation this ram is Persia. Okay, so this is basically Persia. Standing beside the canal, so it's in Persia, it's beside the canal near the citadel, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. And so we know this to be, the Persian Empire was twofold. It had the Medes and the Persians, and they joined forces to do the damage that they did in the world, to take over the world. So there was kind of this co-power, um, and it's the Medes and the Persians, so that's represented by the two horns. But one is stronger, that's why you know about the Persian Empire, not necessarily about the, the Medes, right? So they don't say the Medo Empire, they say the Persian Empire longer. Okay? Again, this will all be, we'll... we'll roll through the interpretation we're giving it in advance here a little bit. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. And so we know that this is what Persia did. No animal could stand against it and none could rescue it from its rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and it became great. So we know the Persian Empire took over and it was it was it was the empire of the world. It dominated the world for about 200 years. 
And again, we know where Persia was. It was Iran. And so it went to the north and to the west and to the south. It went to Egypt. It went over near Greece. And so we're just tracking. Like He is literally saying what's going to happen in a couple hundred years. Okay? So he's got that. So you're with him and you're sitting. He's in Babylon, but he sees himself in Susa and he sees all this history unfolding before himself as this picture of this goat or this ram with one horn longer than the other. As I was thinking about this, verse 5, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west. So I don't know about this. I didn't do any history on this, but anybody ever heard? Like I know we usually go feed goats. Do you ever see a goat with one horn? It's usually like the two, and you're like, whoa, buddy, you're, you're right. Anyways, he's seeing a goat here with one prominent horn between his eyes. This will become significant in a bit. Its eyes came from the west. So we know if you map it, Greece is in the western part of the then known world. It was almost the extreme west of the then known world. And it was crossing the whole earth. Again, think that Daniel in Babylon. It wasn't like all the way around the world. It was just the then known earth without touching the ground. So somehow this goat was really fast or just elevated, but they believed it's fast. And, and uh, there's other reasons for that. And so what's being pictured here is out, uh, the ram that's in Persia is strong. And then Alexander the Great comes with a lightning speed and he takes over the Persians. Um, it came toward the two-horned ram. Remember as well from last week and from our study, horn means authority. Horn means kingdom. So it's kind of like weird. Why are we talking about all these horns? It was significant in that time, and it's, that's what it means. I had seen standing beside the canal, and it charged it, uh, at it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The authority is broken, the kingdom is finished. So this is what exactly what Alexander the Great did. He came flying across Asia and just destroyed everything. In about six years, he was 20, he was 24 years old. He was 22 years old when he started. He was 28, no, sorry, he was 20 when he started. 26, he had conquered the entire world, six years. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, the great Nebuchadnezzar, took him 14 years to besiege Tyre, and he didn't take it over. So when it talks about a fast animal, Alexander the Great was, was lightning fast. And so he blows his way across and attacks, and there's some great stories about him and Darius III, and how uh, he just, he, you know, the Persian army was known, in the past weeks we've heard about this bear, and that's kind of the Persian army. They just, they just engulfed people. They had 200 or 2.5 million people in their army. So it was just this gargantuan, mauling type of situation. Alexander the Great did something that was completely new, technologically and so forth. And he had these phalanxes. He had 35,000 men, between 35 and 60,000 men. So a lot less in comparison. But they could move swiftly. And they just moved around like you've seen in some of those Spartan movies where they moved together. And all the other guys were like, what is this? And they just overwhelmed with speed and accuracy because they could, right? So that's, that's the way it worked. And there's some really great stories which you can read for yourself um, on your own time. Okay, so the ram was powerless, uh, so shattering the two horns, the ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it. Insult to injury here, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became, became very great, now watch these couple of lines, but at the height of its power, we know that Alexander the Great died at 32 after conquering the whole world. At the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. So when Alexander dies, he's on his deathbed, and they're kind of like all leaning in. Who gets the kingdom, bro? Like, you're leaving a big, huge vacuum here because you're dying. Who, you got to name a successor. And you know what he says? He says, it'll go to the strong. Dang. Now it's going to be civil war. But anyways, what ends up happening is there's four uh, generals that were in his army. Uh, and Antigonus, Cassander, uh, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And these four guys, for the next 300 years, run the Grecian Empire. These four guys. Ptolemy, Seleucus, have a bunch of battles, but those four guys. And so, um, 
So before we go further, can we put up the graphic here? Uh, yeah, so remember in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It's like he doesn't know what the dream is. He doesn't know what the interpretation is. Daniel tells him what the dream is and interprets it. And you get all these medals. And these medals represent, and Daniel interprets it. If you go back to chapter 2, it's four empires. And so we talk about, okay, the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, which we're talking about here. Uh, the Bronze uh, Age was uh, the Greek Empire. And then Iron was Roman, the, the, um, the Iron Legs, and then the Iron and Clay at the end. Okay, so if you remember last week, and some people were saying, how come you didn't put pictures up of all these great beasts? Anyways, go to the next one. So this is where it, it mirrors. So chapter 2 mirrors chapter 7. And so again, you have Babylon, but it's represented now as animals or beasts, which cause you to, some consternation. The lion had eagle's wings. The bear was raised up on one side, representing Persia and Medo, Medo and Persia, and the Medes and the Persians. Uh, the leopard had four heads and four wings, which is where we just stopped. So the leopard is fast, fastest of all those animals, and then had four heads and four wings, representing these four army generals. It, it's astounding. Remember, he's predicting this. God is showing this in a vision. He's not even in Susa, but he's getting these visions. And he's, he's, uh, he's seeing the future. And he's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. But... Because we live where we do, we can look back and go, oh my gosh, this just, this just fit. Okay, and then there was the terrible beast, and I don't even know if you can see that because it's so low. But the terrible beast was unlike the others. And so you'll see in the Bible, if you read it, it seems to kind of like, the angel says it's different. It's different. These ones are like, this is, looks like a bear. Okay, we know what a bear is. This looks like a lion. This one is like, it's unlike the others. And so what that speaks of is not only the Roman Empire that is to come, but also an empire, as Gabriel says, that is in the distant future. So we believe that still is yet to come. You can tell why Daniel was troubled in his spirit. So, and then if you fast forward, again, these prophecies are getting more specific as he goes forward. He goes from four and four to two. And what he talked about was this ram with a longer horn, and then the goat, with one horn that was lightning fast. All right? Good? Okay, keep moving. We'll go to um, verse 9, and it says, Out of one of them came another horn. So remember, you got these four guys that are running things, former governors of Alexander the Great. They're running things, and out of them comes another horn. So it's kind of like dialing in being more specific. It started small, but grew in power to the south. They believed this to be somebody named uh, Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes. And uh, so this, this describes him sort of to, to a T, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land, which is a euphemism for uh, Israel. It grew until it reached the host of heavens, and it threw some of the heart, starry hosts down to the earth and trampled them. And Tychus and Epiphanes created probably the most di diabolical thing in the temple uh, of God that was rebuilt, by the way. You remember Cyrus going back a couple of chapters. Uh, they rebuilt the temple and then um, Antiochus and Epiphanes came in and he debauched the temple. It's known as um, the abomination that causes desolation. Like, he just made everything desolate. He just wiped everything out. And he was an abomination in the Lord's sight. This guy was bad news. He was a bad dude. He killed about 100,000 Jews, which, if you know anything about Jerusalem, there wasn't that many people living in Jerusalem. So he just basically came in and just destroyed the Lord. Are you glad he came to church? Uh, so again, it, this horn he's talking about, it set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. He's significant, and there's this spiritual element attached to him. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and it's his sanctuary was thrown down. His meaning God's sanctuary was thrown down. If you know the story, he came in, he destroyed the temple, he uh, set up an altar to Zeus in the temple of God. 
he uh, got a pig, which of course is not kosher. They, they killed the pig in the temple of God. They sprinkled its blood all over the walls. It was just absolutely the worst thing that could ever happen from a Jewish worshiping perspective. The abomination that causes desolation. Then he killed all kinds of people. Daniel was seeing this. In the future, because of rebellion, the Lord's people, so this is kind of where we step in a little bit, because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice was given over to it. God help us. It prospered in everything it did. The truth was thrown to the ground. And then I heard a holy one speaking, to, uh, and another holy one said to him, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled uh, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, or the abomination that causes desolation, uh, the surrender of the, sacri- uh, the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. So how, what, what is going on? So in Daniel's dream, he sees these pe- two people talking. How long is this going to take? And so uh, he said to me, uh, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, they sacrifice in the evening and morning. So there's all this connection and then the sanctuary will be reconcentrated, reconsecrated. So experts have tried to take this 2300 and make it mean something. It does mean a few things, but there's nothing that's like, okay, well, that's on lock. We know what that is. And not only that, remember uh, principle three, don't make of it more than it is. Because there was this man, William Miller, in the 1800s, he was reading through Daniel, and he saw this number 23, and he's like, this doesn't mean evenings and mornings. This means years. And then he gets on his computer in 1843, which didn't exist. He went to his pencil and had his candle and he was doing his math. And he's like, oh my goodness. This temple is going to be rededicated to the Lord in 1843. <gasps> Crazy, right? Does it say years? No. No. And it doesn't say the sanctuary. Yeah, he's like, well, the sanctuary is the world. 2,300 years equals 1843. Good, Jesus is coming back. And so you know what he did? He took his little congregation, his church members, and he said, guys, we've got to get ready. Jesus is coming back. I just looked at, I did the math. This is what it means. Sell your houses. Sell everything. Jesus, we got to be ready. And so they sold everything. He led them. Sold everything. And they went out on the hilltop and they looked toward the east because Jesus is coming from the east and they stood there. We should have brought some snacks. <laughs> you know? Jesus didn't come. So then he's like, oh, wait a second. I miscalculated. It's next year. And they're like, well, where are we supposed to live for the next year? Again, they went out to the hillside. Right? We, we have to trust God in all this. Right? And that's just a great example of not making too much of it. So let's hurry on. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, thank you, Daniel, for struggling with this vision, because we are too. Therefore, before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from the Ulai, the river, uh, calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. So either Jesus or God tells Gabriel to help Daniel, because Daniel's look. Remember, he's sitting in Babylon. He's seeing this, these goat run across the earth, and it's like, I don't know what any of this is, and I'm going to lay off meat for a while, is really what he's thinking. And then God is like, go help him out. You gave him this dream, you gave him this vision, go help him out. And so uh, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate, prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Which is like, you're not helping. (laughs) You're not helping. I wish it was just something that's going to happen next week or something. Now you're freaking me out even more. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep. So it seems like he had this vision, which maybe he was awake. But Daniel is just experiencing this whole thing with God. this All this revelation, which is the word apocalypse. I was uh, in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And then he touched me and raised me to my feet. And then he said, and thank the Lord that all these verses are in here. I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. Because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. Everybody say the end. end. 
Okay, so he's gonna dial back and do a little bit of review and then he's gonna say, this is what's gonna happen at the end. And this guy Antiochus Epiphanes that he predicts, and if you go to chapter 11, he depicts it in, <laughs> depicts it in vivid detail, um, is a type of what's gonna happen at the end. Just like the beast was Roman Empire, it's also a type of what's going to happen at the end. Just stay with me and don't shoot the messenger. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> dividing the word of God. Uh, anyways, I'm going to tell you what will happen the time, later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns an appointed time at the end. The two-horned ram you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Thank you, Gabriel. So in Daniel's mind, he's like, Media and Persia? What? Are they going to rise? Okay, I guess they are. It's like us saying, well, the United States is the, is the, uh, you know, the authority in the world today, but in the future, 100 years from now, 50 years from now, it's going to be China, and they're going to run things. And it's like, okay, I guess we could go there, sure. Um, the shaggy goat, or the he-goat, or this predominant male goat, is the king of Greece. And this, just tuck this chapter, or this verse away in verse 22, we're going to refer to it in just a second. The, um, or verse 21, the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. Okay? So Philip of Macedon was this guy who rose to prominence. He died in battle, and he uh, gave the kingdom of Macedon to his son Alexander, and Alexander went to Greece first, became the king of Greece, and then proceeded. Okay? So just track with me in history again. It's so abbreviated. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay, uh, the four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power, which we know to be true. They didn't really conquer much more else. They just kind of maintained what they had. So, okay, that makes sense. In the latter part of the reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king. So now you've got to just change gears a little bit to this little horn that's growing up. A fierce looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He's describing both Antiochus Epiphanes, who rose to prominence in this huge dramatic story, which I won't go into, and also this is talking about the Antichrist at the end of time, and this is the way it's going to work. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation. Help us, Jesus, and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. Some versions say the saints, which makes a connection between Jewish people and the church as well. The holy people does the same thing. Again, from a 6th century Jewish perspective, he doesn't even know the church is going to come around. Okay? He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. So remember, we were talking all about these kingdoms, now we're talking about a specific guy. It's really important to note that change. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the Prince of Princes. You could preach a whole sermon on just that first. He will be destroyed, but not by human power. That means God's intervention is going to need to take place to make this all work out. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given to you is true. And these are powerful, powerful words. This is like an add-on at the end, but this is so powerful. But seal up the vision concerns the distant future. Oh my goodness. That is so powerful. So Daniel literally writes this whole thing down and then he puts it in his safe box for nobody to see or touch because it's just too much until the end. And if you know anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know they found eight copies of Daniel. Okay. The vision was sealed up until the end. Anyways, it concerns the distant future. And then here is what I love and here's where we're going to end our day on. Uh, verse 27. This is our application. I'm like, God help us. Where do we apply this? Here it is. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. And maybe you're feeling like that. Right now you're like, I didn't get a lot out of church today. There, I know there was a goat and I know there was a ram, but I don't really know what he was talking about. Don't you love when I go into the third person voice? I love it. It entertains me and nothing else. But here's Daniel, and you can just picture him. He gets, God downloads the future in his little brain. And he's exhausted for days on end. And then he says, here's the three points in the sermon, and we'll get to this in a second. I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. 
I don't know about you, but a lot of people avoid coming to church when we talk about Daniel or Revelation. It's like, ah, I'm going to skip church today because I don't want to be appalled by the vision. And that was Daniel. He's like, why? But we talked about it last week. He kept looking. He kept looking. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. I can join Daniel in all three of those things. So a couple of observations, and then we'll make this application quickly. Number one is world-renowned leaders, and I just, I'm so amazed by God and by God's word and how history moves. Nebuchadnezzar, we know as the first, we saw the, the picture up there. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we know in Daniel chapter 4, writes out a testimony of how God is the faithful one. Cyrus is predicted 150 years before he shows up, and then he gives glory to God. So we got two of those kings that are, you know, completely um, in, sort of endorsed by God, that they, they work because of God. And then we're going to read it in a second. Alexander the Great also is led by the Lord. And it reminds me of Daniel 2.20. I don't know if we have this here, Jessica, or not. But if you dial back to Daniel praying, they're going to kill us unless we tell Nebuchadnezzar what this dream is. Switching gears on you here. Tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream is and interpret it for him. So uh, Ananiah, Hazariah, and uh, Mishael, and Daniel all pray. And they go, God, we need this dream. And God gives them the dream. And here's what Daniel says uh, in response to that answer to prayer. He says, praise be to the God, to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. Somehow, by way of a miracle, God is orchestrating all of this. All of this intrigue and all of these things that are happening historically. And everybody thinks, oh, Nebuchadnezzar's like, oh, I'm a pretty big deal. And it's like, well, God really helped you, you know? Cyrus, same thing. God anointed you, right? Same thing with Alexander we're going to see in a second. God is in control. He's on the throne. We've said it multiple times. We have to trust it. The Grecian Empire is so important to, to uh, the lay of the land because... Uh, you guys know about Hellenization, which is when the Greeks came over, they took over, and then they influenced everything. So you'll see the greatest library of all time probably burnt down, so it's gone now. But in antiquity, the greatest library in the whole world was in Alexandria. I wonder where they, they got that name, right, from Alexander the Great. It was in Alexandria in Egypt. The largest Greek library in the world was in Egypt. The whole then-known world spoke Koine Greek because there was this thing called Hellenization. And Alexander the Great was, we're going to respect everybody, but they're all going to speak our language. They're all going to do it our way. And as we come to the Bible, do you know what the Bible's written in? Greek. God, God is orchestrating this whole thing. Um, so, so let's, you want to read something cool? That wasn't very convincing. Yes. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out of the Bible for a second, if you'll allow this, because this is incredible. Remember my 22 reasons why I believe Daniel to be true? Here's one of them. There was this man, his name was Josephus. He was a Jewish person. He grew up, he was born in AD 67, so right after Jesus kind of comes on the scene and all this stuff. Don't put it up just yet, please, uh, Jessica, because everyone's reading that. I have to do the setup, guys. Uh, so there's this man named Josephus, and he's a general, and there's all this stuff. And, uh, and he just kind of connects with one of the guys who later becomes the emperor of Rome. So he curries favor with this guy, even though he's Jewish, and the Jews and the Romans didn't get along for a time as well. Josephus comes under the authority of this emperor, and this emperor says to him in his later years, I want you to write a history of your people. So he was seen as a sellout to the Jews because he was hanging out with the Romans. But by the same token, he had all this inner working knowledge from his time at church, from his time with all his people. And so he sets out and writes something called the Antiquities of the Jews in the first century. It is one of the most predominant sources that we can go to that talks about biblical times that isn't the Bible. So they, they call this an external source of proof, right? So he doesn't have an axe to grind about Jesus. He's not into that. He is a Jewish. He's a devout Jew, but he's really not into that either. He's really just trying to save his bacon with the Romans. Got it? 
So he doesn't have an axe to grind. So that's the whole point why this is significant. But let me, story time with Pastor Rob. Okay, Jessica, now. So that's this guy, this isn't the Bible. This is some guy in the first century. He's writing about history. He's gonna talk about Alexander the Great. Watch this, this is absolutely mind blowing. Now Alexander, when he had taken Gaza, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. I'll read from here. He made haste to go up to Jerusalem. Okay, I'm over here. Oh, just go off that for a second. I gotta set the story up. I, I condensed this down because we could have read, like he's got so much on this. What happens is Alexander the Great is taking over the world. And he goes to this place called Tyre. It took Nebuchadnezzar 14 years. He didn't conquer it. Alexander the Great conquered it in seven months. Speed. Alexander the Great is besieging Tyre, and he sends word to the high priest, who was kind of like the king in Israel, which was only a short distance away. And he's like, my men need provisions. Help me out. This is Alexander the Great. He's a big deal. But who's in charge? The Persians. And the high priest of Israel sends word back to Alexander, we're not going to help you. We have an alliance with the Persians. Bad move. He can't predict the future, but we know that Alexander the Great is going to come and he's just going to wipe out everything. Sends word, we can't help you. Alexander the Great's like, fine. He takes over Tyre. He ends up down in Gaza, which is not that far from Jerusalem, a little bit south. It's on the sea. And then Alexander is like, now I'm going to go and deal with Jerusalem. I'm going to go deal with that high priest. So everybody in the army is going, this is going to be good. We're going to kill some people. The, Jerus the, the, the Jews are going to be wiped out. Jerusalem is going to be decimated. Okay, so that's the setup. Hope that sets it up good. Okay, let's go back, Jessica. Thank you. Her finger is starting to get tendonitis. Okay, and Jadis, the high priest, so he wasn't the high priest when they denied Alexander, but he is now. Another long story. When he heard that, he was in agony. Alexander's on the way, guys, and he is wiping people out in a heartbeat. How are we going to do this? He's terrified. He's under terror, and uh, as not knowing how he should meet the Macedonians, which eventually became the Greeks. Uh, since the king was displeased at his foregoing dis disobedience. Okay, I love that. you got to read that with a British accent. So he said, we're not going to help you. And Alexander the Great is ticked off. He therefore ordained the people should make supplications. Let's go to prayer. We need a way where there seems to be no way. Right? We prayed it ourselves today. And should join with him in an offering and sacrifice to God, whom he besought to protect the nation and deliver them from the perils that were coming upon them. Again, great wordage, the perils. Antiochus and Pythnes came in, 100,000 people died. This guy's gonna come in, who knows what's gonna happen, right? Uh, whereupon God warned him in a dream. Everybody say dream. dream. So he calls everybody together. It's like Daniel, right? Call, this is not the Bible, by the way. He calls everybody together. Guys, we gotta pray. Let's get together and pray. And God gives this guy a dream. Here's how you handle this. Incredible, which came upon him after he had offered sacrifice, that he should take courage and adorn the city, open the gates, and the rest should appear in white garments, but that he and the priest should meet the king in the habits uh, proper to their order, and without dread or any ill con consequences, which the providence of God would prevent. Do you get the dream? Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. He's coming to kill us. We're all going to dress up in white. I'm going to put on my vestments. I'm going to put on my special hat. We're going to just walk, and we're going to walk out toward him. We're going to open the gates of the city. We're not going to make it difficult on him. We're going to go meet him. And everybody's like, uh, I don't think that sounds like a good plan. <sighs> Anyways, okay, we read on. Upon which, when he rose from his sleep, he greatly rejoiced. He's like, hey, I got an idea. And declared to all warning that he had uh, declared to all the warning he had received from God. He tells everybody. According to which dream he had uh, acted entirely and so waited for the coming king. So he's got this plan and they're going to execute it. Uh, and when Jadis understood that Alexander was not far from the city, so he's coming from Gaza, not far from the city, he went out in procession. And when the priests and the multitudes of the city, and the, the citizens, and with the priests and the multitudes of the citizens. So everybody's going out. The procession was venerable, and the manner of it different from that of other nations. Other nations would close the doors and go, come get us. 
These guys are like, no, God told us in a dream. Let's go, let's go meet this guy. It's going to get really good in a second. It's crazy. Okay. The, the procession was venerable in a manner different from all the other nations. It reached to a place called Sapha, which name translated into Greek signifies a prospect. So kind of like there's an opportunity here. For you have thence a prospect, both of Jerusalem and the temple. It's like, okay, we might be onto something here by way of where we're going. And when the Phoenicians and the Samaritans that followed him uh, thought they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the, king's, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse of it happened. So what happens is Alexander and his army are coming in, and then the enemies of Israel are like, we're going to be a part of this too. And so they're jumping in, right? The Phoenicians and the, all the rest of the people are coming and going, hey, we're going to loot this city as well. All right? Um, for Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance, like the dream, in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen and the, the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing with a miter on his head, which is a fancy hat, having the golden plate whereupon the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name and saluted the high priest. What? He adored that name and saluted the high priest. And the army's going, Aw, we thought we were going to like kill some people and decimate the city and burn it to the ground. And he's like, I salute you and I honor you. Why would he do that? Well, let's keep reading. Okay, uh, where was I? He saluted. The very reverse of it happened. And he saluted the high priest. Okay, 11, 3, 3, 2. Uh, the Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander. So they're surprised as the rest of the army. And they're going, hey, yeah, we salute you too, man. You're not killing us. This is good. Okay. So with one voice, they salute Alexander. And they go, hey, man, thanks for coming to our city. We got some food here. And just come on in. And, and in uh and compass him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done, and supposed him disordered in his mind. Are you out of your mind? We're going to obliterate these people. Let's do this. And, and this guy named Parmenian apparently has the courage to go up to Alexander and say, what gives, man? Alone he went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that when all the others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews. He's like, what are you doing, bro? And what, uh, to whom replied, I did not adore him, but that God. He'd never been to Jerusalem before. He was on the rampage. He was going to take over the world. I did not adore him, but that God who has honored him with his high priesthood. This guy's a man of principle, and his God, and he gets even better. For I saw this very person in a dream. Remember we talked about Daniel? This is not Daniel, guys. This is somebody writing 600 years later, writing about the history of the Jews with no axe to grind. This is an external piece of information here. And he's telling about. I get chills. This is Alexander speaking. For I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit. I was at Dion in Macedonia, who, when I was considering with myself how I might obtain dominion of Asia... I'm going to take over the world. How am I going to do this? God gives him a dream and shows him the high priest of Israel. Is this crazy or what? And he exhorted me to make no delay but to boldly pass over the sea thither and that he would conduct, he would conduct my army and give me the dominion over the Persians. So Alexander gets a dream and a prophecy. And not only that, but he says, kind of like to, jo to Joshua, be strong and of great courage and go do it. Everywhere you put your foot, I'll give you the land. And so Alexander's like, giddy up, let's do this. The God of the Jews, is, is this incredible or what? Whence it is said that having seen no other in that habit, he was kind of like waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for this to show up. Oh, here it is. That's why I'm going to salute and I'm going to adore the God of Israel. 
unbelievable. And now seeing this person in it and remembering that vision, the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under divine conduct. Unbelievable. And shall therewith conquer Darius. So he's like, well, now I know that I'm going to conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians and that all things will succeed according to what is in his own mind. So it doesn't stop there. There's a little bit more, but let me just read this unbelievable stuff. And then we'll, we'll, we'll just apply it and go from here. And when he had said this to Parmenian and had given the high priest to his right hand, the priests ran along by him. They were probably really overjoyed uh, that our plan is working. Um, anyways, he uh, came into the city and he went up into the temple and he offered, this is Alexander they're talking about. He offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction. So he steps into church and starts singing Waymaker with them. It's like, okay, giddy up. If this is the God that's going to help me do that, let's go have a worship service. And so the priest is like, well, this is the way we do it. This is Alexander the Great. According to the high priest's direction, and magnificently treated both the high priests and the priests. Here is the kicker in it all. Here's the kicker in it all, guys. Don't let this pass you by. This is not the Bible. This is somebody writing history other than the Bible. They're being spared. Dream and dream have been shown to this very point. This guy eventually takes over the whole world in record time. Check this out. And when the book of Daniel was shown him, wherein Daniel declared what we just read, that this uh, goat is going to come across and destroy the ram, Right? When the book of Daniel was shown to him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he, was, he supposed to himself, I think I'm that guy, because I'm on a pretty good roll right here. He was the person intended. And when he was glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. But the next day he called them and he said, this is blowing me away. This is just like Cyrus, right? When Cyrus was read to him, hey, here's Isaiah 45. 150 years ago, they mentioned you by name. You're anointed by God to do what you're doing. Same thing happened to Alexander. And he spares the city. They all run out expecting to meet their death. And they don't. The guy, he sees this vision. It is unbelievable. And then watch what he does. Whereupon the high priest desired that they might enjoy the laws. So he says, uh, you know, uh, what kind of favors can I grant you guys? And so the Jewish people, they say, uh, that they might enjoy the laws of their forefathers and might pay no tribute on the seventh year. And he granted all they desired. And when they asked him that he would permit the Jews in Babylon and Media to enjoy their own laws also, because remember the Jews were spread out all over the place, he willingly promised to do hereafter what they desired. There's so much more to read, but ice cream. Um, guys, uh, like, right? I don't know about you. This blows my mind. And that's one of 22 that tell us that Daniel is accurate and true. So, all of a sudden, we bristle a little bit because... Well, dang, then, all of that happened and came true. All of what's going to happen is also going to come true. Now, where does that leave us today? So I have a three-point sermon, and I told you, and I don't even know where it is on the notes, but Jessica, you put it on the last slide. And this is where we need to land for today, okay? No, uh, the, the very, it should be the last. No, the, well, the fourth, the last one, maybe I should find it on here. It's, it's the last verse. Yeah, just go back to all white. There you go. Okay. So we're going to go in reverse order here. This is the last verse in this chapter. I, Daniel was worn out. Anybody feel a little bit worn out? Like, should have been with me on Friday afternoon. I'm like, I don't want to read anymore. I'm done reading. It's too much. I can't take it in. How am I supposed to put this into a half an hour sermon? It's incredible. Daniel was worn out. He laid exhausted for several days. Imagine you were it's so in touch with God that God delivered stuff to you and you couldn't even function. The people call you up, hey, you want to come? No, I can't. I've been, I've been ministered to by the Lord. That's what happened to him. And so then he says, then, just hang on, Jessica. You're getting ahead of me. 
Then he got up and went about the king's business. He was appalled by the vision. I think that's so important, and it was beyond understanding. So number one, yeah, go to the first one. Guys, 2,300 goats and rams. We probably are seeing a, a percentage. There's some clarity, there's some interpretation, but there's still so much for God to reveal. Amen? So you're kind of like, well, I still really don't get it. Can we go to ice cream, please? Because I don't understand it. Daniel was in the same boat. So if you don't get it so much, it's okay. You're in good company because you're probably sitting beside people that are also just going like, I kind of get it. I think Pastor Rob's really amped about this. Uh, it sounds kind of cool, right? But I remember the patience part. Just let God keep revealing this to you, right? The second one is, it's troubling. We, we were in small group on Thursday night, and we were discussing some of this stuff, and some people started crying. Like, this is what we got to go through. This is hard. I'm terrified by this. This is, it sounds like there's going to be some really troubling times coming. Yeah. Right? When Antiochus, when Antiochus Epiphanes, can you imagine if somebody came in here and just desecrated the church and did whatever they wanted? We would be so grieved. We would be bawling our eyes out. That's where I met the Lord. That's where I got married. That's where I just, you know, got baptized. And so for the Lord to let this, it's, it is, it's, it's hard. And Daniel's admitting that. So it's hard to understand. It's just plain hard to grapple with. But here's the last piece. This is what we got to do. This is for you and I. This is for you and I. The disciples went to Jesus and they said, tell us the signs of your coming. Right? He's already there, but he's going to leave and he's going to come back. And so this is the Matthew 24. It's the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. In 24, he describes what it's going to look like. And then in Matthew 25, he says, now do this. And he tells three stories. He said there were five wise virgins, bridesmaids, and there were five foolish bridesmaids. The five that were uh, unwise were unprepared. The five that were wise were totally prepared. And when the bridegroom came, they were ready. <laughs> Be prepared, right? Then he said, it's also like a guy who went away and he left his servants with all these talents. And when he came back, the one with five talents said, I had five talents, I made five more. The other one too said, I had two talents, I made two more. And the other one said, I did nothing with my talent. And God's like, away from me, you doer of iniquity. And then the last one was this vision about sheep and goats. And when, Lord, when did we help out the people who are homeless or the people who didn't have clothes or the people who didn't have food or water? When did we help you? When you did it to the least of these. When you were about my business, in a sense. God doesn't call us to be experts in prophecy. God doesn't call us to cower in our churches and pray that all of this will pass. God calls us to courageously do his work until he returns. Like Daniel, he got up. He was appalled. He didn't understand. He went about the king's business. And that's what we got to do as a church. We have to confidently just step into what God has for us as a church. Come what may. Amen? Amen? Let's be about the king's business. And if you do want uh, me to share my notes with you, as unorganized and chaotic as they are, I can do that. If you want to chat about this, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to process with you. There's so much more, guys. There's so much.